At Five Star Bank, community is at the heart of what we do. Every day we strive to have thoughtful solutions for our customers and help our communities prosper. Honest dialogue about the issues affecting the region is vitally important to that prosperity. We are proud to be part of the conversation and hope you'll join in. We are wrapping up the second season of Studio Sacramento. As production for season three begins, we will continue to invite policy, business, and community leaders to join me right here to discuss the issues and the people that have an impact on our region. But first, we'd like to share some of the highlights from this past season and ask you to join us for all new episodes beginning July 12th as we continue the conversations that matter right here on Studio Sacramento. Let's talk a little bit more about bridging gaps and, and how we live. Th this book, um, All American, 45 Muslim Men on Being Muslim, you have an essay in this book and it was fascinating to read in, in which you talk about the fact that you grew up all-American kid, you spent a little bit of time overseas, loved baseball, uh, went to parochial school, and it, it's a quintessential American upbringing. But then 9-11 changed your life. Tell us about the epiphany or, or what happened that changed your life. Well, you know, I, I knew that morning, uh, you know, I think most American Muslims knew that morning our lives changed forever. But I, I just thought quickly, I said, you know, look at my background. Um, born in this country, um, I went to Orthodox Christian preschool. I went to Catholic school. Um, so I, I knew the challenges we face. I knew, I knew both sides, you know, so, you know, and I knew how to bridge these gaps because that's all my life I had to be the bridge builder, whether it was at Catholic school, answering the questions about Islam uh, and so forth. So I knew that day that I had to step it up. And many American Muslims realized that day, especially the ones that were born in this country, realized that they had to step it up and let their fellow Americans know who we are, what we stand for, and I think really a lot of times we don't blame our fellow Americans mm -hmm. for, for the misperceptions that they have about Muslims. I mean, if they just turn on the TV, they're going to see an angry guy with a beard mm -hmm. burning things down. And so, um, you know, we, and I always tell our community, we had, we had one story where the FBI went to a Muslim's house. Guy is a doctor, has a big beard, very nice guy, very well respected in his hospital. Uh, but, you know, one of his neighbors uh, called the FBI and said, you know what, all these guys with beards are going over his house. And so when I talked to the FBI, they said, you know, we, any, we get a call, we have to look into it. But then I turned around and I asked the Muslim, I said, do you ever speak with your neighbors? He says, you know, I say hi, you know, from, from a distance, you know. I said, no, it's your fault. I said, it's your fault. If you don't reach out to your neighbors, I, said, I told him, growing up in San Francisco, we knew our entire neighborhood. Everyone knew us, right? During a religious holiday, we'd take our sweets. During the religious holidays, they would give, give, bring us their sweets. Um, and so I told him the importance of reaching out. If your neighbors don't know who you are, Right? And this is the image they see on TV. They're going to be afraid. But if you go over there, give them your sweets, invite them over, um, you know, and they'll say, you know, we know these Muslims. They're good people. They're family people. You know, they believe in the same thing that we do. Well, there seems to be a, a difference in terms of generation. Let me read you something that recently came out. There's a recent study by uh, the Gallup organization called Muslim Americans, Faith, Freedom, and the Future, uh, examining U.S. Muslims of beliefs 10 years after September 11th. And it says here, Muslim Americans are unique in the level of optimism they express about the future. Regardless of affiliation, Americans rate their lives about a seven on a zero to 10 ladder scale and expect to be even more satisfied five years from now. No other religious group, however, expects things to improve as do Muslims. So while there have been challenges in the post 9-11 era, it, it sounds like that the community is fairly hopeful and that especially that the younger generations are really stepping forward in a way that hasn't happened in the past. Can you tell us a little bit about that in our final moments? Um, American Muslims, um, you just look around the community where they're building Islamic centers, American Islamic centers that are catering to the American Muslim community, I'm not catering to a, you know, a country overseas or folks that came from overseas. Mm -hmm. People realize, many of the immigrants realize that you know, for, for after, maybe after five years, you know, like, oh, eventually we'll go back home, right? And then after a while, some people try to go back to their home countries and then realize that, you know, we're actually American. 
mm-hmm. you know? Our children are American. Mm-hmm. We're so used to America and we're so used to the religious freedom of America um, that, you know, we can't live here. And many of them came back to America because in this country, I would say that you can practice your faith better than any other so-called Muslim country in the world. When you say experiencing life and society, give us one vivid lesson that you took from that. I think that she took a moment in time to um, say, explain to me that I had the advantage of being in an outstanding school system um, and that I had advantages in life that a lot of other kids didn't have. And as a blonde, blue-eyed little girl, I had advantages just by virtue of being white Mm -hmm. in our society. Um, And she shared that information with me in a way that I had never thought about before. And she taught me a really important lesson. And that is that society is willing to throw away some kids. Wow. And in that moment, that's when I got that core value of social justice, of the responsibility that we have to each other and to especially the most vulnerable among us. How does that drive you today? I think my entire career Mm -hmm. is driven by this concept of social justice, this concept of the responsibility that we have to the vulnerable, that we cannot be satisfied with our lives until we know that we've reached out to the vulnerable and that the greatness of a society is defined by how we treat the vulnerable. And so when I understood that society is willing to throw away some kids, I said, I'm gonna fight for the people that society doesn't fight for. And that's what I've done throughout my career. And how did you get from there to where you are today? It's been a great journey. Um, After I aged out of the foster care system, um, I went to um, the local university, which was the University of Michigan, Mm -hmm. in a six-year pre-med med program. For me, school and education was always a really safe place. It was a place where you, if you, if you did what um, was expected, and then you could excel. And so I always enjoyed school. So it was a logical transition for me to um, go into this special program. And it was a great opportunity. Right away, I got to understand things like the social determinants of of health and the opportunities that you have as a physician, the trust that patients place in you by virtue of being a physician. So it was the perfect career for me to go to medical school. Let's go back in history. Let's Mm -hmm. go back 50 years. And when you and John Cole and Gino Gladden and uh, Mrs. Lee all got together and founded this institution, What were you thinking? What were you trying to accomplish? Well, it's amazing. Uh, We never would have thought that uh, from a kitchen table in in which we uh, worked the first edition Uh out, from that uh, that, uh, beginning, that uh, that, uh, initiation, that we'd end up here 50 years later to talking talking about an outstanding paper that has been this nation's number one African-American newspaper a number of times. So we, we, we had no idea. The, the, the key there is that we wanted to serve those, Scott. That, that was our main intent. Mm-hmm. Uh, there was very little information. We feel now uh, there was no marketplace of where a person could go and find out events in the African-American community. And so our intent was really to provide that kind of information, information from events that were occurring, information about groups that might be forming, some of the deaths and births, if you will, mm-hmm. of, of our community and that type of thing. Well, give us a sense of the times, Dr. Lee, okay? okay. Because this happened as part of an era. Yes. Tell us about what was going on at that moment. What, what was meaningful and relevant to you? Well, you know, the culture of the times uh, is that we, we really had very few African Americans in key positions, in any positions and so forth. There were no black judges, as an example, uh, no blacks on television. Uh, no blacks, if you will, on our city council mm-hmm. or in our board of supervisors. Uh, very few in the capital. In fact, uh, <laughs> we were looking at the other day and we f- felt in, when we were formed the Observer in 62 that there actually was only three African American staffers working in the state capital. You're can, kidding. Can you imagine that? Wow. And, you know, so, so from that 
very first beginning, we were able to uh, serve really kind of as a catalyst for, form, for, for many of these job opportunities, for many of the, uh, the, the uh, announcements that were occurring, for many of the, actually the appointments that were being made. And we were consulted frequently uh, by those who are in positions to make some of those appointments. In incidentally, in being a catalyst in breaking down doors, you didn't just do that in the African American community. There's a story that I recently heard about how publications like Time and Newsweek oh, couldn't yeah. participate in the coverage of the Capitol, and the Observer broke down the door that allowed them uh, to be able to be a part of the, the bureau. Tell us, tell well, us that know, story. We, actually, we could not be we could not be credentialed, if you will, because we were not es uh, essentially we met the the rules committee requirement at that time was that you had to be a daily newspaper, as an example, in order to have a credential. So you couldn't get up and cover. So uh, uh, magazines like Time Magazine, who was not not obviously a daily uh, publication, nor were, were the Observer could not be credential. So we, in a, in a sense, we challenged that, uh, uh, that uh, credentialing rule and, and, and was able to change the rules uh, committee uh, requirements at the time. And uh, we were able then to open up the doors for, for many of the publications who wore weeklies and, and uh, other publications as well. So we pioneered in many of those kinds of efforts and, and, and actually assisted the Rules Committee in rewriting mm -hmm. the rules as it uh, applied to uh, credentialed uh, publications. So back in that era, you, you have encountered over your time, and you have as well, Larry, just a, a plethora of historical figures. Yes. Who among them really stands out in your mind that uh, were folks that you, you, to this day, you remember and you say, wow, that was really a person worth remembering. Well, you know, it's uh, it's so interesting because we had opportunities, obviously, to meet during that time. Everyone from the political leaders, actually, the the uh, celebrities that were traveling. Political from leaders like who? Political leaders like uh, you know, of course, all of our our governors. That mm -hmm. essentially, beginning at that time, uh, from from Pat Brown, uh, my wife even went to work for Pat Brown for a short time, mm -hmm. as an example. Uh, through, through Governor Reagan, through uh, Duke Machen, through Young Brown, the current uh, governor of our state. Incidentally, G Governor Reagan, President Reagan, used to come by the office in Oak Park. Yes. Well, we, 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 we established a real personal relationship with, mm -hmm. at that time uh, uh, when he was governor of our state with him because not only were our kids going to the same school, Brookfield School, mm -hmm. together, uh, we were able to go to... Uh, uh, establish a, a working relationship with him and as a result when he got ready to name several appointments he he would com come by and we would chat about some African Americans that were worthy of being named. President Reagan in Oak Park. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Can you believe it? Now what is Mingi? Mingi is the name of of what the tribes in the South Omo believe their children can be born with in some cases um, uh, a couple are not married, their children is declared during pregnancy to be minky. It, it loosely translates as unclean, mm -hmm. it means they're cursed. Um, sometimes their top teeth come in before their bottom, that, and then are a twin. And that's a big deal. That's a big deal. So there, there are different reasons. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the couple is married, but they did not announce at an elaborate ceremony to the elders that they were trying to conceive. So once a child is declared minky, they are executed, many of them at birth and some when they're older, sometimes their second teeth are coming in and those children are aware of what's about to happen. Now, now Preston, you've worked in these <coughs> orphanages and, and, and been back to Ethiopia. What is the, the, the belief system that drives the, these tribalists, uh, tribes members, to engage in this practice? And one would think that in this day and age that, that such practices would be a thing of the past. Mm -hmm. That's true, but these villages or tribes are really in the middle of nowhere, in the heart of Africa. And these tribes have been there for a long time. There's one in particular, they've been in this area by the Omo River for about 100 years. So there's lots of superstitions that have kind of crept in into their culture, and they really want to preserve their culture. So uh, when these things come in, they don't like to change that much. So if someone from the outside comes in and wants to say, hey, you should stop doing this, they don't want to listen to it. So somewhere along the way they believe that a curse came upon their land when these things happened with these children 
So with the one that Candy described of when their upper teeth would come in before their bottom teeth, uh, they kind of held the children there until there was a drought or they had bad crops. And they said, okay, this child needs to be the sacrifice to help alleviate wow. this curse from the land. And um, Now you yeah. actually have, have you negotiated with these tribesmen before and to rescue these children? Uh, yeah, I was a part of some of the rescues. Yeah. Uh, we worked with the Ethiopian staff there and uh, one of them was a tribal leader's son. Mm -hmm. So he was very involved with the negotiations. And well, give us a sense of that type uh, of, of what happens, how, mm -hmm. how these children are identified, how the team goes in and rescues them. How does that happen? Uh, well, so some of the babies are left stranded in the bush when they, it's deemed a, ming, a baby mingi, and that's one where a father and mother maybe didn't announce that they wanted to try and have a child. Uh, so those children are killed very early on. Uh, the older ones, there's something called the mingi gate, that when you go to one of these villages, it's this wooden framed kind of archway that you walk through, and there's different passages. One passage is for a wedding, so a husband and bride will pass through it before they go through the ceremony. And the Mingi Gate is just to the side of that, and they pass the child through this doorway as part of the ceremony uh, before they kill the child, either by throwing them into the river or leaving them out uh, in the wilderness. It just seems so cruel and heartless. Mm -hmm. And this is just sort of, it, you make it sound like this administrative procedure mm. that is thought of without any emotion attached to it. Yeah, it's difficult. I think uh, a lot of the people in the tribe do not like it. And obviously the parents don't want to harm their children. Uh, but there's a lot of so much superstition and kind of just the power that the eldership has over the village that they keep these people in a lot of fear and saying, if this does not happen, then you're harming all of these people, not just your child. So it's kind of for the sake of the community that they do this. Uh, and there's disagreements. The elders want to keep the tradition and that going on and continuing it. Uh, but the f families and the parents f try to fight against it, but they just can't really. So it's a very sad thing and an emotional it, thing. What were you trying to achieve in the design? I mean, what, what was kind of the thought process in how this design, one, takes care of its functional needs, but also integrates into this neighborhood? It's a, it's a very complicated process, to be honest, and there isn't a straight, simple way to answer it. The, That's uh, okay, we like complexity it, on this show. It's the, <laughs> We've thrown a few curveballs at him, too. <laughs> so. it's, the, it's really the convergence of um, a, a lot of different ideas and a mm -hmm. lot of different desires sort of being then exhibited in one building design. So it's a challenge. We, I think they, they came to my office and, and, and me in particular because of my long commitment to the central city and to the Midtown neighborhood in general. And uh, for 20 years I've lived and worked in the, in the neighborhood. So I, I know it pretty well. You name an intersection, I can visualize it in my mind. Um, I'm not going anywhere. My office is on Capitol Avenue and the theater will be on Capitol Avenue. So it's, it's a neighbor to me both in terms of home and work. Well, I'll just jump in and, and say, Scott, it, it became increasingly important to us around, you know, as, as the recession started settling in and all of that stuff, to br really bring this project home and really get a local team put together. Mm -hmm. or to, you know, one, because it seemed like the right thing to do. We're a local community project. We should really be working with local architects and builders and contractors as, as much as, as possible. And, you know, and Ron's knowledge of Midtown. I mean, we looked around and pretty quickly got, got to him as a candidate. He's, yeah, he has, he's, he has a holistic vision of Midtown, whereas one architect, one highly talented architect might come in and just say, here's a gorgeous building. But he sees all of Midtown, you know, as one landscape and how to integrate it in there. So it's, well, that's the thing yeah. that, that's mm -hmm. remarkable in that when I looked at the drawings for the project, what struck me was how one, it was strikingly and singularly beautiful, but also how it sort of just flowed into the rest of that street. And I walk those streets myself, um, you know, to the restaurant Bernardo that's close by and, and some of the other amenities in the area, but that it just flowed in and seemed to seamlessly integrate while still maintaining its own character. Well, and I have to say, it's a, it, it's a remarkable opportunity to design something like this in one's own community. So we embraced it uh, wholeheartedly and took, took great care in terms of what the, the form would ultimately become. And it, in my mind, it really evolved and grew out of the, the work we did with 
the B Street team and also with our understanding of the central city and the neighborhoods surrounding the B Street site. You are known as a guy who does heavy lifting on big issues. And one of the things that's happened most recently is we had the tragedy in Newtown. And that affected you profoundly. What did you learn from that experience that you brought back to the work that's going on in the legislature? Well, as you know, uh, I've been committed to this issue of improving the mental health system in California for many, many years. I think it is one of the forgotten issues of our time and that it is inextricably connected to every other social and educational problem uh, that we have in this society. But because of stigma, because we don't like to talk about it, it tends to not get the attention and it certainly usually falls to the bottom of the budget priority list when it comes to state and federal budgets. But a couple things have happened uh, over the last year. There was the Newtown tragedy where everybody asked, why didn't somebody see the signs in this guy, Adam Lanza, from Connecticut and do something to intervene further? But it wasn't just that incident, Scott. It was also what happened in Sacramento with the terrible story of Nevada busing a mental health patient to California and, uh, and leaving him, uh, essentially for the cops to pick him up. Why was that important? Because it shows that Nevada, for one, um, has substituted for a decent, cost-effective, compassionate mental health system, uh, putting people on a Greyhound bus and dumping them in another state. And I think that, that speaks to the gravity of this issue and why more attention, public policy attention, must be paid to building a better mental well, health let, system. Let, let, me though, let me give you sort of the devil's advocate position sure. on this. <clears throat> that busing of that patient, in part, some might say was driven by the fact that we provide a better a safety net in California than Nevada does. And you're the father of Prop 64, which 63. was 63, which was the millionaire's tax. Correct. And which provided a, a, a new floor for providing community mental health care services. So, in fact, it, so, you know, some might say that, in fact, we're becoming a magnet now because of the fact that we're providing more services. Absolutely no excuse for what Nevada did. Every state needs to have a mental health system. And will we back off on providing services because they choose to act in that way? Never, not as long as I'm around. Uh, but our work is not done here. So, so Newtown, the Nevada story, uh, compelled me to, in my last two years in the legislature, and with a slight budget surplus, not much, but a little bit, to say, if we can invest a little bit of money, where should it be? Now, you said I authored Prop 63. I'm very proud of it. It generates a billion dollars a year for the kind of system that we want. What, just quick association, what are the things that you leave behind that you've done that you're most proud of? Well, it's a long, a long list for me. So uh, if I had to just <laughs> winnow the San Francisco Bay Trail, it's mm -hmm. almost 500 miles of recreation opportunity mm -hmm. opened up around the Bay. Um, consumer protection things that weren't no special interest really cared about, but things like if you're going to get called for a, a jury, don't keep people there endlessly. You know, call them for one day, or if they get onto a panel for a trial, one trial. Uh, if you're expecting people to wait at home for the cable TV guy or the phone or furniture delivery, Tell them when you're going to be there within a four-hour window. So there are things like that. that. It's interesting that you would go there because those are sort of Joe Lunchbox, bread and butter type issues. They're and just, you're not talking about some grand yeah. multi-billion dollar thing. That, that's actually surprising. Well, they're practical. And, you know, and then I spend a lot of time working on social insurance things because health insurance and things like unemployment and disability and child care impact people's lives in ways that these sort of grand schemes don't. And I always thought though that was worth my labor. Mm. You know, after 46 years mm -hmm. and when you retire out of this office, is it at all scary to think about waking up the next day and not having a, an elective office to go to? Uh, 
well, I, I, I don't know what I'm going to do next. <laughs> and so there is this sort of cliff effect feeling. Sure. Um, but I'm, you know, I'm ready for that. It's whatever it is, it'll be fine. And that's our show. Thanks to all the guests who have joined me at this table over the past two seasons. And thanks to you for watching. We'll be back on July 12th with a brand new episode. For Studio Sacramento, I'm Scott Syfax. See you next time right here on KVIE. At Five Star Bank, community is at the heart of what we do. Every day we strive to have thoughtful solutions for our customers and help our communities prosper. Honest dialogue about the issues affecting the region is vitally important to that prosperity. We are proud to be part of the conversation and hope you'll join in. All episodes of Studio Sacramento, along with other KVIE programs, are available to watch online at kvie.org slash video.